Hi, and you're very welcome back to the Final Whistle League of Ireland podcast here on finalwhistle.ie. Once again, my name is Brett Neary, and I'm joined by Dean Zambra, the captain of Longford Town Football Club. Dean, you're very welcome back to the hosting duties here on the show. Yep, glad to be back uh, toward one, so looking forward to it. It's been an interesting start to Longford. We're going to be catching up with one of your teammates, Lee Stacey, later on in the programme. But um, defeat to Sligo at the weekend. Happy? Disappointed? What's the the take on it? Yeah, well, not happy, obviously. Um, disappointed, really, with the, the loss. Um, there was nothing in the game. It was very, very close. Um, probably lacked a bit of quality, really, from, from, from both sides. There was nothing really engineered or manufactured in terms of chances or, or shots. Um, I know Lee made a great save in the first half. Um, but not a lot in it, and the, the goal was quite scrappy. So we're disappointed that you know it was a you know ball into the box that kind of was kept alive, and then just nodded in kind of tamely into the net. So a little bit disappointed with the manner of the goal. Um, thought we competed well and worked hard and and plenty of endeavour, which which is great. Like you know, but um, it's not a result and it's not points. So we need to correct that uh, quite quickly. Um, we don't want to get into a slippery slope of of losing games, having made a positive start. Yeah, and I think uh, Endeavour only gets you so far in the Premier Division. In terms of the game, I was texting Alan Kino as as, um, as the game was progressing on, and we were talking about kind of more or less the same as what you just said. But I actually said about halfway through the first half, I was like, I think Dean Byrne and Callum Warfield are going to be the the actual deciders in this game. I think a, a minute of madness or a minute of magic from either of those two might be just the bit that sends Longford ahead. And then within, I'd say, eight minutes of me texting that to Kano, both of them came off injured. A huge loss to the side. What's the, the situation with the two lads? Will they be back for this week's clash with Drata? Yeah, I would think, obviously, they're, they're going through a little bit of rehab and a little bit of work on their injuries at the moment. Uh, I'm not actually too sure how severe both of them are. So we'll have to wait and see how they progress over the week. But like you said, it disrupted us uh, during the during the first half. Like both both players were causing troubles in their own uh, different environments. Callum's obviously a big target man, and I, I think as well we probably relied on hitting them too much. You know, when you see that big target up there, like probably went to him a little bit too much and a little bit too direct, and uh, gave him a lot to do and a lot to chase. Um, and then Dean Bourne, obviously we've spoke about before, has a lot of quality and a lot of ability in those small tight areas. So again spoke about a lack of maybe quality and chances in the game that's somewhere where where Dean could have came up and, and like you said yourself it could have been just a moment out of nothing and, and that's the type of player Dean is so it obviously disrupted us having to make two two changes in, in the first half but um hopefully the lads are back sooner rather than later because uh, they're both good options yeah when you're working off a, a kind of a smaller squad in terms of the the, the first team at, at the club it, it's difficult to lose two players it's that pivotal to the attack and nature of the, of the side um what's was said at half time obviously scoreless at the half they didn't score until the first couple of minutes of the second half what was said at half time maybe about that change or the changes that you'd made to try and cope with the loss of those two players yeah, well, I think um, obviously we had to regroup just a small bit and even things like set pieces and, and jobs and where people are supposed to be uh, for certain things. So I think it was just recorrecting that, you know, so we were all set up and um, knowing uh, what the jobs were for the lads that came on um, specifically. So, you know, not too much time spent on it, but just kind of a reinforcement of, you know, the tactical plan and, and where the newer lads, the new lads had come on, were going to fit into the, the setup for the second half. Of course, that game, a top of the table clash going into the game, the winner would be on the top of the table for at least a couple of hours and maybe 24 hours until the, the next day's fixtures kicked off. But one that we're more traditionally used to seeing as a top of the table clash took place a couple of hours later in Tala between Shamrock Rovers and Dundalk. Of course, the fixture that brought up that Jordan Flores wonder goal last year. Um, what did, did you have you seen, watched any of that game back? I know you would probably would have been traveling back from Longford, but uh, was there anything kind of that struck you about that particular clash this time around? Um, I think it was still kind of an early season game, really. Like, um, I'm sure if you ask anyone at Chamber Rovers, they probably feel they can go up a gear or two, and I'm sure Dundalk will say exactly the same thing. They haven't really hit the ground running just yet, so. Uh, probably still uh, areas in for both teams to improve on, but I think you're seeing glimpses of quality. Obviously, Danny Mandrew's goal and that shot from outside the area that we're accustomed to seeing now uh, over the last couple of seasons. So uh, still elements of quality about the play of both uh, teams. And like you said, that's traditionally a top-of-the-table clash. So uh, a lot of good players on show, um, but again, a lot of new players on show as well. So I think both teams are still trying to gel everyone together. 
I think Dundalk could be a little bit disappointed that they couldn't convert a couple more opportunities that they had in the game and probably a little bit disappointed that they didn't get something out of it at that point. But um, like I said, so, so early on in the season. So um, I think both both clubs and both teams probably have have more to give and more to offer. And I'm sure they'll be looking for it in the coming weeks. Now we're going to be joined by a goalkeeper in a couple of minutes, Lee Stacey. But the game on Friday, a lot of reports, uh, I suppose, comparing the two performances of both netminders. Alan Manis, as we would expect at this stage of his career, covered himself in glory with his performance. He was absolutely outstanding. He pulled off some amazing saves that he probably had very little right to make. At the other end, a bit disappointing maybe from a BB. He hasn't impressed me. I know he's got a few glowing reports, particularly with the penalty save and stuff in the in the President's Cup final. But in terms of the the performance, he's looked a little bit jittery. He hasn't exactly looked like the, the real deal for me. What's your thoughts on maybe on, on the two keepers on the night, on, on Friday night? Yeah, well, obviously, you know, anything that needs to be said about Alan Manis has already been said. One of the best keepers in the league. Rock solid. Gives you a base. Base to win a league, really. Um, and that's exactly what Rovers are looking for. Um, obviously, been brilliant for, for so long. And still does it. Still does it at the highest level. Still makes important saves and important games. And that's, you know, the definition of, of a top-class goalkeeper. Um, on the other side, young, young players come in uh, from a different country. Uh, Dundalk have gone down that route, bringing in a couple of foreign players. And, you know, it can be hard to gel, even off the pitch. So, you know, I think we'll probably see better from them. But I'm not entirely sure. Obviously, they'll be working on stuff uh, behind the scenes. But um, we'll see. Can he get there? You know, he might remind me a little bit of, and I'm not comparing the quality, but a little bit of David De Gea's first season at United, where people questioned like his physicality and maybe questioned, you know, was he up for this type of league or whatever the case may be. So maybe there's an element of that there. Like if he can, if he can get through a little bit of a rough spell, you might have a little bit of a gem there because, as you said, he's he's made some good saves and at times as well. And specifically with the goalkeeper position, an error is a goal. And and again, with a young player, you kind of get a little bit of inconsistency. So, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't write him off just yet. Three games into his League of Ireland uh, career, but you know, Dundalk uh, will obviously want uh, to challenge for a league title. So you know, they might have a decision to make. Uh, depending on how the next couple of games go. Yeah, of course, two on the final score there. Two rovers on the night goals from Mandrew, as you mentioned, and Dylan Watts with a late as consolation, I suppose, from Pat Huben because um, Dundalk had a couple of chances and Manus kept him at bay. But honestly, I don't think either side would have been too disappointed uh, with a draw based on the performance, but rovers would be over the moon to have come away with the full three points on the day. It hasn't quite happened yet for Dundalk. Uh, we might chat about that in a couple of minutes because there's a couple of managers that maybe are just kind of beginning to look over their shoulder a little bit. I hate that that's happening three games into a season, but but that's kind of the way uh, the pressure is in this sport at the moment. And uh, Moving on to Saturday evening's games in the Premier Division, of course, another clash of two Dublin sides, both looking for their own European ambitions. Keith Long, uh, his Bohemian side, hosted Stephen O'Donnell's Pats side. Uh, tough, tough clash, settled by a Ronan Coughlin header midway through the second half. Uh, Pats will be delighted with that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure Stevie's delighted with how they've started. Um, they look really fit, sharp, competitive. Um, I think, you know, knowing Stevie and the way he wants to play, they want to play good stuff, but they seem to have that little bit of steel about them as well, or a little bit of competitiveness, which is important too. Um, Daily Mount's hard place to go, you know, under Keith Long, they've been very, very good. So he'd be over the moon getting the three points there. He'd be absolutely delighted to come away uh, as winners and to edge out balls in that game. And Keith will be a little disappointed. Uh, I'm sure he's, you know, he's been hired on players to try and get them up to speed this season. But they'll probably look back and say they're only a couple of kicks of balls away from winning, winning probably the three games, really, like, you know, when you look at it. So um, that's nature. That, that's nature of the game. That's football at times. So, you know, there's not a huge amount more you can do other than kind of keep grinding, keep working hard and, you know, try uh, and try your very, very best to kind of get that rub of the green or get that bit of luck where, you know, the kick of ball bounces your way and you get the three points on the board instead of the opposite way. Yeah, but uh, I think it's it's time for Bose to maybe kind of look at what they're doing. I think I think they've been really impressed over recent seasons, and this is an uncharacteristically slow start from them this year. I think they'll still be there thereabouts come the end of the season. I wouldn't be getting too worried just yet. Uh, Keith Long has pulled many rabbits out of those hats over the last couple of seasons. I think he'll do something similar again this year. Moving up north to the Ryan McBride Brandywell, of course, Waterford made the longest journey in the League of Ireland up to Derry this weekend. Um, 
interesting game. Uh, Oscar Brennan definitely had a all all four seasons in one game uh, up there. He scored. He missed a penalty. He got two yellow cards in about uh, a couple of minutes. Uh, saw red. Uh, he's going to be kind of a bit disappointed himself. But I suppose on the overall uh, three games or three points taken back to Waterford. Um, good start for the Kevin Sheedy era. They're kind of finally up and running. Yeah, they'll be. They'll be delighted. They'll be absolutely delighted. Like as you mentioned, the longest journey in the league. Um, you know, players can even think about that before the game, kind of say, oh, "This is a long one." You know, that way you might not fancy it all that much. So to go up there, really tough place to go again, and you know, to get a result, to get the three points, they'll be absolutely thrilled. Um, Oscar, as you mentioned, you know, going to be an important player for them. I'm sure he's disappointed with the cards, but you know he's going to be really important for them and, and driving them on a little bit. He's got a little bit of uh, experience there, League of Ireland experience and played in the Premier Division um, a num- numerous times. So he's going to be um, a mainstay for them. Um, we'll see, you know, does it affect them like wouldn't be an out, out of the side. But, you know, that was a brilliant result and probably one that wasn't tipped, you know, if you looked at the fixtures over the weekend and specifically with the journey as well, you're kind of saying... Um, that would be difficult for Waterford to get an out of it. But again, I think it just shows the competitiveness competitiveness of the league that a couple of teams that have been written off early have got wins on the board already and there's quite a compact group from from top to bottom like you know there's no one streaking away there's no one cut adrift and I know that's hard to do anyway after three games but you know everybody seems to have some level of competitiveness and and are gonna cause problems for teams throughout the throughout the fixture list. In terms of, I suppose, the bigger picture, uh, discipline. Uh, losing someone like Oscar now, obviously, he'll miss a couple of games for suspension. Uh, we've seen Mike Newell already suspended for Waterford because of uh, indiscretions he may have said to the officials up in on the first day of the season at Heading the Game Park against Drogheda. How much, how important is it to keep your best players and even officials in the dugout um, available on match nights to be part of that and to have them uh, to be part of the team rather than looking on from the stands? Yeah, well, it's absolutely vital because you don't have, uh, you know, you don't have a huge amount of options if you go too deep into the squads. Like this isn't England where you have 25 internationals kind of in your squad. You know, you you, you need your, your top lads available. You need your coaches available. And, you know, it can be frustrating. You can get frustrated with decisions and, and you can, you know, scream and shout for them. But, you know, you have to conduct yourself in a certain manner and a certain professionalism. And um, I think it would be vital for a club like Waterford to keep someone like Oscar on the pitch as much as they possibly can. And I'm sure uh, they'd be having words with him. But, you know, he's a, he's a reliable lad usually in general. So I don't think that you're going to get a problem there all season long. But going back to your point, yes, absolutely vital to keep your core group of important players and, and coaching staff around and on the pitch and, and not have people suspended and in and out of the team because that breaks up continuity then and, you know, it stops any kind of momentum building. Yeah, final game of the weekend. Speaking of heading the game park, was there. Finn Harps, league leaders coming into the season, or coming into the weekend even, should I say, not into the season, into the weekend. Uh, they took the lead. Carlos Sullivan with an absolute belter of a volley from the edge of the box, but 10 minutes into the second half before Mark Doyle pegged one back very quickly thereafter. Uh, game kind of petered out a little bit. Not really a whole pile outside of the goals actually to talk about in the game and um, but both sides reasonably happy with the point uh, and keep that kind of league table total just ticking over yeah i think they will probably be both happy enough you know, for the point especially early on in the first round of fixtures you know get whatever you can get on the board um don't lose games it is obviously important um finn harp's playing really well though like it seems to be a huge amount of confidence throughout the team um, they fancy their chances of getting points in every game you know, and possibly winning games no matter where they go and you know that momentum and that confidence is brilliant you know you can't buy it, it, it it's really important for a club to have and um, you know I know Tim Clancy's team's well played against them for the last couple of seasons never going to give up never going to give it away easily so not surprised that they got back into the game and got an equaliser. And again, I'm sure overall, Tim, he's probably pretty happy to, to get a point out of the game. Um, if this was the second or third round of games, or maybe even the last round of games, you might be looking at a game that you need to win, depending on where you are. But um, I think both Reeves would be happy with a point uh, coming out of that one. Yeah, and of course, that leaves the league table. Three teams level on the top. Only 
alphabetical order separating the top three sides in the table. Finn Harp, Sligo Rovers, St. Pat's with identical results. Seven points from their open three games. Yourselves, Longford Town, Shamrock Rovers and Drogheda United on four points, uh, albeit with a game extra to play for Shamrock Rovers. They, of course, played Derry in 10 days' time in a refixture due to international call-ups. Waterford on their own in seventh place on three points from their opening three games because of that win at the weekend in Derry. And then a surprising enough trio in the bottom three of the table. We might chat on that for a second. Dundalk, Bowes, one point each, and Derry still without a point on the table, albeit, as we said, only with two games played. Very surprising to see those particular sides at the foot of the table. I don't think that would have been many pundits, but then the pundits seem to be getting it wrong left, right, and center this season. Uh, what's your own take on, on those sides do you expect them to be involved in a relegation battle or is it really just a case of just not getting off to the best start? Yeah, well, like with my players had on, I, I wouldn't even look at the table from from their point of view and, and from the coach's point of view. There's a long, long way to go. Not something that I'd be interested in looking at. Um, obviously, there'd be a, an urgency to get points on the board, but I wouldn't be too too concerned. Um, on the flip side, on the media point of view, you're obviously going to highlight you know teams that have not started well and um you know might be a bit of scrutiny on, on the players and the coaches there but again you know it's three games in 36 game season this year hopefully all going well and we don't have any cancellations or any stoppages but like that's a huge huge amount of time to go and i'm sure all the clubs are just still working hard trying to find the right gel trying to find the right balance maybe trying a couple of players in different positions and things like that as you said, with Derry, they've only played twice, you know, nothing to say that they can't win the game in hand, even though it's against Shamrock Rovers, but that's the type of league we're in. Um, Bowes, again, like I mentioned, a couple of kicks of a ball away from probably winning two or two of the three games at least. So, you know, definitely not panic stations or time to, to worry about those sort of things. It's, you know, really getting up to fitness level, getting sharp, you know, make sure the tempo's in your game and, you know, probably comes down to a couple of mistakes and errors here and there in the games and if if all the clubs can eradicate them you know those three clubs in particular will will pick up points and like i said i don't don't read into the table too much at this point in time it's something to look at you know coming into the last round of games probably more so than anything and then you're kind of saying this is the team we are and this is the team we have been throughout the season yeah, of course. Looking at the top scorers list as well, Adam Foley on top three goals, while Connor Davis, Romeo Parks, Patrick Hoobin, and Ronan Coughlin uh, also on two goals apiece in the season so far. And looking at the other end of the field in terms of clean sheets, five goalkeepers with a clean sheet to their name so far. Yaros from St. Patrick's Athletic, McGinley, Lee Stacey, who we're going to be talking to in just a couple of moments, David Odomusu, and Ed McGinty all have one clean sheet from their three appearances so far. Not a lot of clean sheets in the league so far. It's been a fairly high scoring opening to the league and a long may that continue because it is goals we love to see. But fair play to the five lads for keeping at least one clean sheet so far this season. Um, in terms of the first division, if we turn our attention down there, obviously you're well familiar with that over recent seasons. It's been a very interesting start to that season as well. Clubs like Shells, Galway, not quite up and running yet. Um, let's maybe start with that clash. Uh, Shells and Bray, 3 all. What an absolute cracker played on Friday night. Yeah, brilliant game and uh, I think a great advert for, for the league and specifically the first division. As you mentioned, I've been in it for a couple of seasons there and you know, trying to tell people and trying to drum up a bit of interest, saying there's, there's brilliant quality, there's great games, there's good teams, there's very good clubs in there now, big reputation clubs in the league. Shells obviously being uh, one of them specifically. Um, but what a what a game, brilliant mm -hmm. game, three all, lots of back and forth in that game, and quality of goals as well. I think everyone everyone will probably have seen Brandon Kavanagh's uh, strike, which was fantastic, like you know. So, um, again, just shows the quality, the ability, of the players, and you know, plenty of interest in the first division this year because it's going to be extremely, extremely competitive. As you mentioned, some of the the favorite teams not quite off to to a great start. Some of the other teams have have stolen a little bit of a march, but. That's what it's been for a couple of seasons now. It's going to be really, really competitive. Yeah, of course. Two goals from Georgie Poynton and one from Ryan Brennan for the home side, while Brandon Kavanagh, as he mentioned, uh, that screamer, but also he got on the score sheet twice in that game. Ryan Graydon as well. Now, Connor Hoy did tell us at the start of the season that he thought Brandon Kavanagh was going to be player of the year for Bray and across the whole division. So interesting to watch him progress through the season. Uh, another big surprise, maybe, uh, was the game in that lone town. We 
would be traditionally used to seeing Galway challenged at the top of the table at Lone Town, down near the bottom. That seems to have been turned completely on its head. 3-1 to Athlone. They raced into a 3-0 lead. Uh, Galway did manage to pull one back. Um, Waweru, I'm not quite sure if that's, I'm pronouncing that right, uh, got one back late on for Galway. Uh, but two goals, Stephen Meany with two and a Gary Boyle and OG uh, set them up. Within half an hour, they're training up. Nobody saw that coming in Athlone. Probably not even if they're honest with themselves, Athlone. Yeah, well, I, th- I think they've recruited well and they, they look quite a decent side. So, you know, maybe they were expecting to kind of do something or are certainly hopeful that they could. Um, Yeah, it was a little bit of a surprise though looking on the outside, especially the nature of the win, like 3-0 up after, in, in such quick time. And you usually don't associate that with a John Caulfield side. You're expecting them to be very organised. Hard to be, hard to break down. Um, so yeah, but that's again we've we've said it a couple of times on the show. That's football that can happen. Um, I'm sure John probably at half time wanted to win the second half as a consolation, and they were able to. So he's probably challenging his players now to be to be better than that going forward and and to really respond this week. But um, all credit to Atlone. It's a, it's a great win, and and they really you know had a ding dong battle with UCD the week before. So that's definitely a, a really bright start for Athlone and I'm sure Adrian's delighted with them. Yeah, we had spoken on the show here about how well they've recruited through the off season. And I know we spoke to Adrian, I think on the first show of, of the, the podcast about how happy he was with that recruitment. I think we expected to see them better than bottom two. I think that's a given across the entire league. I don't know if I expected them to be blown Galway away in that, in that way, particularly when you consider their best player last year, Ronan Manning actually jumped ship to Galway uh, yeah. and the players who might have been released by Galway coming in the likes of Michael Schlingerman and one or two others um, will be I'd say personally delighted with that as well because there's nothing quite like when somebody tells you you're not good enough for what we have planned and then you go out and kind of don't really read the script and ruin the party for them uh, a couple of weeks later it's always that nice little kind of yeah I've just proved the point there uh, no matter what happens after this I've I've shown what I can do and, and how good I am uh, so they'll be delighted with that I think as well uh, at loan currently third in the table. We'll, t- we'll talk about the table as a whole uh, later on in this program. Uh, Treaty United and Wexford. Treaty United, uh, I think this is probably the the result of the weekend for me. Their first ever victory at this level. Uh, huge results. 1-0. Scrappy, not a great game, but they won't care. They're on the board. First victory. Yeah, and like when we spoke to Tommy, I kind of got that impression that you know, they, they're going to be a competitive side and they're going to put it to teams, but I actually fancy them this weekend. Just it's a difficult little journey for Wexford to go across country like that. And I think, you know, yes, it's a new side in Treaty, but again, you can't can't write off a, a Tommy Barr team and, and no numerous players there that that I know and have played against. And I just think they'll cause upsets. They got a decent point in the first game and I just I just felt that they could win that one, you know, that way, especially early on in the season again where Wexford are probably travelling to play them and not really knowing a huge amount about what they're gonna face, just because it's a new club and new team. Obviously they'll know some of the players like we've like we've mentioned. But um that's a brilliant result and a great start for Treaty and I'm sure they're um they're happy with, you know, the the progress they've made as a club more than anything. But to reinforce that is getting points and that, and that helps, you know, it helps bring in fans obviously not into the ground just at the minute, but it helps get an interest around the town that they're, they're not getting beaten every week or they're not kind of discarded before, you know, we can even get fans into the ground if they can be competitive and stay in the league and rattle off a couple of wins and a couple of points here and there, like, and, and, and stay competitive. That's all the better for, you know, when we are able to get fans in and people can come and watch what, what they're doing there, you know? Yeah, but for the second week in a row, a uh, player sent off fairly early in the game again, around the hour mark, Clyde O'Connell. He joined Sean McSweeney, who got sent off against Bray. Again, uh, Treaty, we spoke to Tommy on the show a couple of weeks ago about how tight his squad is, how he had to pull it together in very, very short order just before the start of the league. He really can't afford to be losing players, particularly players of the quality of Clyde and Sean uh, week on week if they start picking up suspensions. I wonder, is it just a little bit of over exuberance, you know, at, at the moment, like would it be in that kind of new team and new setup and lads wanting to do really well and wanting to be really competitive and probably just making too many kind of challenges or, you know, maybe a couple of silly challenges, a couple of late challenges and things like that and getting into a, a bit of trouble. But um, like you said, and we, we've mentioned already, you need to be you need to be controlled and you need to, you know, keep your keep your calm and keep your cool head because 
the more disruptions you have, the more red cards you have, the more suspensions you have, it's so, so hard to gain any kind of momentum and continuity. And, you know, for all the good that it's done with the start, if, if they start picking up suspensions and a couple of injuries, and again, Tommy has referenced the squad's not as deep as he as he may like for the for a League of Ireland season. If you're missing a couple of important players, it can become really difficult. And then you can start sliding into kind of losing games, um, you know, on the bounce. So they'll hope to avoid that. Uh, again, like I said, maybe put it down to a little bit of exuberance early on um, in the new experiment down there. So I'm sure Tommy will work on it and, and try to control the lads a little bit better moving forward so so they don't get those disruptions. Yeah, I suppose uh, another big shock in that division this weekend. Cork City beaten at Cabin Teeley. Cabo must be delighted. They're top of the table. It's two wins from two. Uh, but Cork, is there something, I suppose... It's 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 a long way down from Cork from where they were two or three years ago. I don't even think it's fair to compare the squad now with the squad back then in terms of the resources, in terms of everything that's happening around the club. But uh, where do Cork go from here? I think it's about learning how to play in the division a little bit. Um, I know I had it myself, like played most of my career in the Premier Division and then dropped into the First Division to play with Longford. And probably thought uh, the players around me are Premier Division players. We should be able to win this these games and get promoted and whatever the case may be but it doesn't always happen like that and I think you need to find a way of playing first division football almost so that might happen at Cork a little bit here where you've got a lot of lads with Premier Division experience specifically young players with only Premier Division experience a year or two maybe under their belt and then players like Garrod and Dylan McGlade who've played primarily Premier Division football in their careers they're going to have to find a way to win first division games and I think what they came up against is the perfect way to play first division football almost with with Pat and Eddie and Kevin Teeley and I wasn't really that surprised that they won because I'd never write off Pat Evans teams and I'd never write off Kevin Teeley having played against them on numerous occasions over the last couple of years and that's well seen a huge amount of the game only just uh, highlights and things like that that was what stood out to me that Cork probably are trying to play a Premier Division type game a little bit Kevin Teeley are perfect first division team so it was a clash of styles, and in Stradbrook, I, I think you know it's not that a huge of a surprise that Cam Teeley edged that one out in the end. Yeah, no, but uh, interesting to see how that develops through the the full twenty seven games in the league this year. Cabo always strong starters as well, so interesting to see how that pans out later in the in the season. In terms of the final game, and I saw most of this game because it was the league kickoff on Saturday evening, uh, UCD four uh, goals for the good against Cove Ramblers down in St. Coleman's Park. they got to be happy with that. It was just a, a tour de force from UCD, and they haven't really been mentioned much in the discussion about teams that could possibly challenge at the top end of that first division t- title. But uh, looking at Colm Whelan, Liam Kerrigan, Jack Keeney, Paul Doyle, um, and that's before you even get touched the defence at all, who weren't really bothered overly on Saturday evening. UCD really do have a, a wealth of talent, particularly in an attacking sense. Uh, they could do some serious damage in that division this year. Yeah, and that's, again, like I mentioned with, with Pat Evan there, I never write off UCD because I've seen them, again, experience playing against them in the in the first division. And it, probably the feeling that season was that ourselves would go up, our job would go up, UCD won the league. So, it's a similar kind of setup there. They have they always bring through players, they always bring through quality, they always have good athletes, um, you know, fast, strong, quick, aggressive players. And again, not really a surprise that they were able to go down. Maybe a surprise that it was 4-0 and it was so comprehensive, because again, uh Cove usually make it quite difficult for teams going down there. But um, as you mentioned, you don't write off UCD because they have that conveyor belt of good young players all the time. Uh, the balance is usually are they a little bit naive in games and can they win enough games to kind of top the league or get into the playoffs and win playoff games or are they a little bit naive but I think that group seems to be a very good competent group and um, we obviously played them in the playoffs last year so they do have a little bit more experience of first division football and playoffs this year to to back themselves up but again very good quality very good players scored some good goals again and they'll be delighted with their start and don't write them off because they can definitely be one of the teams in the mix to win the league, not just to play, to get up through the playoffs. Yeah, great, great start to the season for UCD. There's currently in second in that table, as you mentioned, Cabotelli top of the table, six points from their first two games. UCD, Athlone and Treaty United, uh, they currently sit probably joint second, really, a uh, UCD ahead on goal difference because of that 4-0 victory, four points each in that case. Cork City, one win, one defeat, three 
three points from there, opening two games. A while then, uh, Bray, Shells and Galway United, three teams expected to challenge heavily for the league title this year, all in the bottom half of the table, despite, as we said, the caveat, it is only two weeks into the season. And I think in the case of uh, some of those teams, they've just played each other, so they haven't really had a, a crack at the other teams in the league just yet. Yeah. Wexford and Cove still without a point uh, two games into the season. In terms of the top scorers, Stephen Meany of Athlone, he's top of the, the charts. Three goals uh, from his opening two games. Brandon Kavanagh, Georgie Poynton and Liam Kerrigan, two goals each in their uh, opening two games as well. And then in terms of the clean sheets, we have five keepers who have managed to keep shutouts in the division this year. Lorcan Healy, Brian Marr, Brendan Clark, Connor Kearns and Ty Ryan all with one clean sheet to their name. Uh, all those have played two games. Ty Ryan, uh, 100% record. One clean sheet, one appearance. He'll be delighted with that. In terms of the interviews, let's maybe get stuck into some of the chats we're going to have with our guests this week. We're going to start with one of your teammates, Lee Stacey. Now, our first guest on the show today is someone that you know quite well, Dean, and that, of course, is one of your teammates at Longford Town. Uh, we thought we'd better get someone else's voice from the club on the show. And one of those is, of course, someone you know really, really well because he's been in the trenches with you at Bishopsgate for the last three seasons. And that is, of course, Lee Stacey. Lee, you're very welcome to the programme. Afternoon, fellas. Thanks for having me. You're more than welcome to be here. Um, it's been an interesting start to the season for Longford. Maybe a few surprises. Uh, we spoke to Dean about it before, about the, the result over Derry. But uh, from your own point of view, how have the last couple of weeks been in a Longford Town jersey? Um, positive, Breffney. Um, we've we've battled well in the opening stages. It's only three games in, so still a lot of football to be played. But we're, it's positive in the camp. And I think we might have um, changed our perspective on a couple of people's minds. So happy enough to keep building. and. Um, and using the platform we had to, with the start to go for it. There's not much by me asking you a lot of questions about the club, obviously, because we know everything that's going on there. But from your own point of view, from, you know, obviously full view of the field from the goal, what's the, what differences you've noticed first three games between kind of Premier Division and First Division level? Like? I think um, as a whole, in the, in the across the both leagues, you don't get much time on the ball, like... You see in the Premier League and goalkeepers nearly have all day a lot of the time to um <laughs> to play the ball, but literally about twenty minutes in in the Derry game and um Park House was down on my neck and I had to improvise really quickly, you know, I literally didn't have a second. And then same again, I took a heavy touch against um Sligo and I was fouled by David Cawley. Like the lads are really, really on, on top of you within seconds. So it's definitely a bit sharper, um and Players are obviously really clever in, in, in how they press. Yeah, just for me, I've noticed that like probably a football and IQ has gone up a little bit of a level, like intelligence with within the players that you're playing against. And that's not to say it's not present in the first division, but I think Premier Division clubs have more time to work on that kind of thing. So whereas in the first division it might be kind of a lot of physical stuff, a lot of chasing, hurrying, closing the ball down. I think Premier Division teams are trying to set you up to kind of fall into a trap and pinch the ball off you a little bit like would you notice that yourself? Like just again from behind our back four, what would you what would you say? Like, yeah, see, I've always kind of been um, been looking out for things like that. Any time I've been following the Premier Division, which is forever, really, you watch teams and Dundalk, especially. They always I always used to notice they not they wouldn't necessarily trap you in the in the first um, first phase, but they have that trap planted for the second phase, and then they go and win the ball back straight away. So it's um it's yeah it is it's obviously as you said there. These are full time. A lot of my full time teams they have time to work on the technical side of the game, so you can you can notice the, the sides and how they transition and um, shape and get into attacking positions from defence really quickly. And it probably is more fluid in um, in Premier Division teams than Fourth Division. Like no matter what happens in a Fourth Division game, you have to be fit, you have to be physical. Otherwise, you're going to be left behind. But if you're a little bit more technical, like the UCDs who've been successful in the Fourth Division, um. You, you will do better, but it's more level across the, the Premier Division in terms of teams that a lot of teams are good at that as it is. Now, I want to know how much you're paying the photographers that have been covering your games because some of the photos that I've seen of you making saves in the last couple of weeks have been pretty much like career defining ones in terms of I hope you're getting them nicely printed up on the wall because there's been a few really, really nice shots here. Are you on backhanders? 
Um, no, there's not actually. I'd, I'd nearly be giving out about some photographers. They, a lot of them don't like goalkeepers, but recently, um, they've been really good. Um, but I've always been making those kind of saves, Bethany, to be honest with you. So it's about time to start um, paying attention and uh, taking a few pictures of goalkeepers. So no, the one the shot from the weekend was brilliant. I was uh, really pleased with that. I only posted there on my LinkedIn. I have a similar one from training that I'm screen grabbed from um, a video. So. It's nice to have that and look back and compare and see the work that you're doing training and actually coming off of matches. I think that's that's the nice part of it. Speaking of shots at the weekend, um, let's talk about Gary Buckley's header. A bit disappointing to concede a scrappy goal like that. Haven't been in the game so long and, and so well through the last couple of games as well. Yeah, if you were to break down the goal, there's a couple of, couple of points where it may have went wrong, but I think just straight after half time is disappointing. I think. Um, the longer the game goes on, I think it will actually favour us more if you're going on the last couple of performances anyway. So, yeah, it was. It was the second phase of a corner. It's not It's not really ideal, but look, you're going to be punished if you have any lapses of concentration at this level. So, it's a learning curve, and I think we have good enough lads to um, to basically identify what's happened. We we have done that and, and work on it for, for the next game. Yeah, you touched on the individuality of the position there, Lee, with making saves. Obviously, you make saves and you're a hero and any kind of mistake from a goalkeeper, you're, you're the villain because it ends up in the net. But um, in terms of psychology of the position, it's a little bit more individual, isn't it? Like maybe a tennis player, a golf player, a darts player, that kind of individual mentality within the framework of the team, obviously, but it, it has an individuality to the position as well, doesn't it? Yeah, of course it does. Look, it's a very lonely position, the goalkeeper, and when you make saves, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, that has to be making saves, that's a job, which it is, like, and, and that's part and parcel, but you do tend to get hammered because any sort of mistake is a goal, and and you, you just have to accept that, like, that is that is part and parcel of the role, and you have to be mentally strong, like, you, I think um, I heard Stephen O'Donnell speaking about his goalkeeper who made a hand in error for the goal against uh, Drogs last week, but apparently he bounced back straight away, and he was, it didn't phase him at all, and that's the most important thing. You have to bounce back because as a goalkeeper, you are going to mis- make mistakes and like you might make one mistake in the game and it will cost a goal, whereas outfield players make tons of mistakes like throughout the game. Like it, and it's not nowhere near as highlighted. So the most important thing is don't let it phase you. Um, but, you have, but you have to... That, that only comes from being strong mentally. It's, it's easier. It's just saying, ah, it's okay. You have to focus and work hard on that mental side of the game. And again, that only comes with a high level of training and, and good performances in your, in your log as well. In terms of that, though, why would anyone choose to be a goalkeeper? Sp- saying as a failed goalkeeper myself, <clears throat> why would anyone make that choice to put themselves under that scrutiny and pressure week in, week out for their team? I don't know. Like it's, um, I don't think I woke up one day and decided I was going to be a goalkeeper. I probably wasn't good enough for outfield to play to play there at the time but <laughs> me too <laughs> as uh when, when you get older your goalkeepers as you know well um they always think they can play outfield and I, I i'd like to think i could have um if i was needed but um yeah i don't know I, I don't know many goalkeepers that have said i'm gonna be a goalkeeper i think it just happens and then you you're naturally good at it or whatever it is and you have good hand and and you can dive or jump, I suppose, and then you'll work on it and get better to try and master the position. I think it's it's more of something like that. I'm not too sure. Is that why you went up for the corner at the end of the game at the weekend? Yeah, well, in fairness, if you see the footage back, I'm actually winding up for a volley. But um, if Joe Gorman, see, Joe Gorman scored a couple of headers, so I I didn't ask him to stay down, but I actually should have because I had a I had a free header. Had he he said stay it down, but um. Yeah, I definitely fancy myself to get at least one goal in my career. I actually have won my balls, but I was playing out for the other time. <laughs> in terms of that, though, realistically, third game of the league, um, is it that a case of let there's a point on offer here if we manage to grab a goal in injury time? Or what's actually going through your mind as you're making your way up the pitch for that in the last minute of a league game? I, I understand a cup game where it's do or die, but in a league game where it could come down to goal difference at the end of the season in terms of league positions... What's the the motivation to kind of get forward? Um, it's to not lose the game. Definitely, like we we're losing one nil. It doesn't matter if um if it's the league or cup. Like you, you just don't want to lose the game. I think 
losing can become a habit. I think a draw might have been a fair result the other day. Um, and I just think if you get up there, you might cause chaos. Against UCD in the playoff, I went up for a corner um, just before full-time whistle. And I made a movement, and you can see it clearly in the video. And I brought Liam Carrigan with me, and I made space for Joe Gorman. And he scored ahead of him. We, we go and we go and end up getting promoted off the back of that. So it's just it's just good to get up there and cause problems. And I probably should have got more in the mix, to be honest with you. But I was just cautious of um, of that. There was nobody around me. So if it comes to me, I'm getting there, and I was very close. So that's all. It's just try and try and get back into the game. That's all. It definitely brings a bit of flair to uh, to proceedings when you kind of see the keeper coming up trying to get his head on something. Uh, in terms of, the, I suppose, how the season's gone and the players that have come in, we've spoken to Dean a bit about it on previous shows, but in terms of, I suppose, your impact, uh, there's a couple of new faces right in front of you at the back. Aaron O'Driscoll, probably the most high-profile of those lads to come in in the back four in front of you, Paddy Kirk as well. Uh, how much have they brought to it in that step up in quality? Um, I think all the signs that we've made have been excellent, and that's the truth. I think you, you look at the bench and everybody could play. Like even the lads not on the bench, they could all slot in and and play. Like no, and there would be no difference. I think that everyone knows our jobs. We all have different qualities about us, but I think you all bed in nicely to what we're trying to do and and the the way we play. And um, but I think the most pleasing thing is the competition, and I think other lads have excelled. Um, from the step in class basically the strength and depth in the squad is definitely what's required for Premier Division football and it's um it's paying off with um with the level of performance as we're saying throughout training and on the pitch then. Just mentioning the competition there for places Lee like I'm looking at the standard of keepers across the league and you're talking we've three but other clubs have two you know minimum two very very good goalkeepers like I'm gonna ask you to take yourself out of the equation a little bit here but who do you think's the best keeper in the league or who do you think that the top couple of keepers are in the league um, at the moment? Um, look, Friday night on RTE, he does it again, Alan Manis, he's um, he's a real um, idol of mine, I think he's I think he's the best in the league, that's the truth and I think most people will say the same. Um, behind him then, like obviously Gary Rogers is, is gone, I think Gary is a very underrated keeper, obviously he made one or two mistakes as, as we spoke about, we got punished for mistakes, but people don't see how reliable he was um, throughout most of every year. Like, um, looking at a couple of younger keepers, you have James Talbot and I think Ed McGinty is solid. Like, these are lads who are only really starting their career. So, there's, I think there's a real good bit of talent across the league. You now there's a couple of keepers starting to come towards the end of their careers as well. So, there's definitely yeah, I'm going to be a transition in keepers over. Uh, over the next couple of years. Now, uh, Dean mentioned that there was three keepers in the club. I suppose last year, yourself and Luke, uh, you were ever present. You played every minute of the league last season. Uh, how did it feel from a personal point of view when Mike, when Mick Kelly came in so late in the in the preseason? Um, did it put a little bit of extra pressure on you? Was it something you welcomed that little bit of extra competition for the place just to push you on another level? Well, look, competition is healthy, so that doesn't that doesn't bother me at all. Um, Mick is a good keeper, as is Luke. So I'm happy to be working with that level of keepers, you know. And my standards won't drop, like based on anybody else. So I'm very thorough in how I work. And at the end of the day, if I'm not happy with myself, I'll rectify that. Or else, if you do need a kick up the air, sometimes I have good enough staff that will they'll tell me nicely if you like. So um, oh, I was I was welcome for um, Mick to um. The same because if anything ever does happen to me or whatever, you know, you've you've good keepers that can go in and help the team and, and that's the main thing is um is the team. So competition is good, standing the keeping is, is very good and we have some great sessions there. So happy enough with with, with the lads. All, all the competition is welcome across the pitch. So this weekend, of course, you meet the other side that have come up from the first division, which you both have started really, really well to the season. What's your thoughts going into the game? Yeah, we're looking forward to it. Um I think the most important thing is to have a good week's training and um, bounce back from the result in a positive manner. And I think, obviously, look at where we went wrong and try and rectify that. Draw it are a great side, so um, it's going to be a really tough challenge. We know they play an exciting brand of football. And, you know, some of the players I've played with, a lot of them, and they're really top class, to be honest with you. And they, they belong in the league as much as we do. So I think we'll see a very exciting game now on uh, Saturday. Any predictions? 
no predictions or I won't get into any of that. I'll, uh, I'll see how the game goes and maybe we'll have a chat after how I really feel. Absolutely. Well, listen, thanks very much, Lee, for joining us. Thank you, Dog, wants a bit of attention, so we're going to let you go. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Lovely. Thanks for the ref. Cheers, now. Lee Stacy, there. Obviously, he's been a huge part of your club over the last couple of years and, and that promotion push. How important is it to have somebody that you'd really trust behind you as your last line of defence team? Yeah, you really need to, you know, stability there and know that there's someone trustworthy in, in the goal. Like, and Lee has been brilliant for us, a lot of big, big saves over the last couple of years. And, and so far this season, we've seen it again. And, couple of saves in the first half against Bowes to kept us in it and big save against Sligo there the other day um, in the first half that was captured well obviously by the cameras so um, yeah really really important Lee has been great for us but also around the league you can see how important that solid number one goalkeeper is to, to the teams that are successful in the league now, one person whose name might not be that familiar in League of Ireland circles, but has been heavily involved in a fantastic development over the last couple of years up there in Donegal in Bally Buffet is Paul McLoon. And he joins me now to talk about the fantastic news of the announcement of a grant towards the new Finn Harp Stadium project. Paul, of course, uh, in his professional days, a former general manager of Sligo, General Hospital and also a Chief Executive of Northwest Tourism. So a man who's well involved in community projects and community initiatives over the years. Paul, you're very welcome to the uh, to the podcast. Thank you very much, Bradley, and you're right. I, was, uh, I worked in the public service for uh, all of my working life and uh, did a lot of voluntary work with kind of projects. I'm from the town of Ballyshannon in South Donegal. And I just had an interest all my life also in soccer. I followed the Irish international team, I think for over 40 years. I was at the FAI Cup final. I was working in Dublin at the time that Finn Harps won in 1974. So I've kind of had a fondness for Harps all my life. And I've also, like my family has a great tradition in the J, and uh, I followed Donegal far and near as well. So I have a great interest in sport. Uh, but uh, just that little passion for soccer always, and uh, unfortunately, a Man United supporter as well. So we all have these little uh, crosses to bear, but I, I have more fondness for my local team than, you know, when I watch the Premiership and all the money. I just got the passion for Harps, and uh, my son, Kieran, who you know yourself, suggested I had just uh, retired from the public service that I go to a public meeting in Bally Buffet three years ago, and I went to that and put up my hand and said a few words and that uh, you know you can either i can look upon that as one of the biggest mistakes in my life or one of the greatest things i ever did because the following day i got a phone call uh would i come in and help and that was my introduction to harps Brefney. well as, as you mentioned that meeting in 2018 and since then you've been really pulling on this project along can you tell us a little bit i know it predates your involvement but can you tell us a little bit about the history of, of where this project is from when it was first mooted, maybe in the mid noughties around 2006, 2007? Yeah, well, it started that there was a project. Uh, John O'Donoghue was the Minister for Sport at the time, and he was up in uh, Donegal. And like, I'm not talking out of school, but there was a very strong Fianna Fáil uh, tradition there. And he, he muted the idea with them. They were talking about upgrading uh, Finn Park. So he suggested they should go to and build a new stadium altogether and that be money for it and that type of thing so in fairness to the project team at the time they followed that lead that it designed something which would be quite similar to Tallis Stadium as it's turned out now uh, very ambitious I would have thought for the twin towns of Bally Buffet and Stranorler but down the road that road they went and then the Celtic Tiger crash came about uh, Fianna Fáil went out of power who were you know financially, if you like, backing it in government at the time. So that whole kind of structure collapsed. And the stadium, there was only a million spent, but to put in the kind of superstructure for a main stand. And because of lack of money, it, you know, it has sat there uh, since the Celtic Tiger crash uh, for the last five or six years now. And uh, was just looking at that and... Uh, like I've been in most League of Ireland grounds no more than yourself, Brefney, over the years. Uh, and we've looked at what has happened recently uh, with regard to Irish players going to the UK. 
And it's evident to me that unless there is a very strong League of Ireland, soccer will collapse in this country and uh, it will happen to the international team as we're seeing at the moment. We just haven't the strength in depth. And uh, so if we're going to develop youth and develop high quality soccer in Ireland, we must have the proper facilities. It's fairly evident if you don't have good playing pitches, you don't have good coaches, you won't have high quality players. And the one thing that's lacking in the whole of League of Ireland is facilities. Like at most clubs, uh, I'd say 70, 75% are playing in substandard stadiums. They don't have training pitches, things like that. So when I became involved with Harps, I said, you know, we should look at a, you know, the future, be more strategic in our thinking. So it's not just a new stadium we're talking about here. We're talking about uh, leasing ground for another two training pitches, retaining Finn Park, because I also looked on in horror two years ago at the women's international team, uh, where they were borrowing tracksuits, probably talking out in the back of cars. So the plan for us is that our academy and women's soccer will be headquartered in the current Finn Park, which we've applied for additional funding for it as well, to resurface the pitch and to upgrade the floodlights. And we will proceed now with a new plan to develop the new stadium. So we see four or five football pitches. And since the collapse of the, the, the previous project, Donegal County Council have promoted the Twin Towns of Valley Buffet and Norler as the sports hub of the county. So our proposal is to put a sports hub for soccer based in that part of Donegal. So critical players in this is the FAI, the Department of Sport, Donegal County Council, and indeed Finn Harps, as I stated. Yeah, and of course, uh, just for people who aren't that familiar with Bally Buffet, because it is a fair old trek for most parts of the country, to anyone who's listening to this from outside that neck of the woods. You have, of course, got Finn Valley Athletic Club, which is a phenomenal facility for a town the size of Bally Buffet and Stranorler, and also the GA are, I suppose, headquartered there in terms of Bally Buffet being their main inter-county pitch so it really is an opportunity to create that within those two towns um explain the two towns to me as well because a lot of people won't be familiar with with bally buffet strand Orler, and the fact that they kind of coexist on uh, either side of the river yeah well the twin towns well it's the finn river hence uh finn harps and it's strand Orler, bally buffet like i live in bally shannon which is uh, at the site of the county people would be familiar with Bundorn, for instance, which is four miles from me. So Bally Buffet is 34 miles from Bundorn. It's 14 miles from Letterkenny, which would be, even though Lifford, which is about 20 miles, is the capital of Donegal, Letterkenny is certainly the population centre uh, by some distance of the county. So uh, the JA, as you rightly said, Donegal County team have always played in Bally Buffet because geographically, like from one end of Donegal to the other is nearly 130 miles. So it's a very big county. Uh, so Bally Buffet is a good centre for sports. And as you mentioned, the JA in tandem with uh, McCool Park and Bally Buffet, within the next few months, the centre of excellence for Gaelic will be opened in a town called Convoy, which is nine miles from uh, Bally Buffet, Stern Orler. And that, it has five pitches in it. And you mentioned the Finn Valley Centre, which is a superb athletic facility, swimming pool. There's a rugby and soccer pitch there. So the county council strategy of a sports hub for the county is certainly materialising, except for soccer. And, you know, unless Finn Harps take a lead, and that's why, I, you know, we've all been waiting. Why isn't the FAI doing this? Why isn't the department doing that? But, you know, the clubs have to come to the fore as well. So... We put our proposal together. Now, we got an allocation last week, what they call a provisional allocation of a circa four million. And the project's going to cost a lot more than that. So we'll have to talk to all the partner agencies again. We'll have to fundraise. But we have a passion about the senior club, uh, about the academy and women's football. So we will have, within two years, 16 teams. And that's what I mean by we need additional facilities, not less. People talked about closing Finn Park and just working out of the new stadium. But soccer in Ireland needs better facilities. So you need more pitches, better coaches, and you need a pathway for young people. And if the League of Ireland rises to the occasion, 
you know, we don't want people to go over there play a second division in Scotland or third division in the England. You know, we should have a league of Ireland that is very competitive. And if you look at Norway and other countries of similar size, even Portugal throughout Europe, they have far better leagues and their teams are more competitive in Europe. So why can't Ireland aspire to that? And we certainly will not do it if the facilities are as they are now. And that's where guys like me who have a bit of a history uh, working with grant agencies. And uh, so why wouldn't I go out and assist someone like Finn Harps? And uh, like our manager, Ollie Horgan, is becoming famous for some of his interviews. He does himself and Paul Hegarty. But actually, uh, they have worked off a shoestring budget. And I've watched them in action for the last two years. And they're, I'd call them role models. I've never seen two people work as hard. So it's not an accident that Harps uh, have kind of retained their position in the Premier Division. So the ambition of Ollie is over the next two, three years is that Harps would become kind of like a mid-table, but certainly an established Premier Division side. And when the new stadium opens, it's our ambition to start challenging for Europe. So there's a plan on the pitch and there's a plan off the pitch. And uh, I'm really excited about the lady soccer idea for Finn Park. So I think the plan is good and it's about us all rolling up our sleeves, stop complaining and just get on with the job. And we know it's going to be bloody hard, Breffney, but uh, someone has to do it. And uh, there's a great team. It's not you're talking to me now, but there's a great team of people uh, involved. So, uh, and I say, it's not Finn Harps alone. It's all the other agencies, it's the council. It's about the staff, and we we'll certainly be engaged a lot with the, you know, with the private sector in the county to help us financially. So it's a big challenge, but I'm sure everyone viewing knows the story with their own club or in their own region and the difficulties. But if we all go at this together, I think we can have a much better League of Ireland. Yeah, and I think if we look at the model uh, in South Dublin with, with Tallah Stadium and Shamrock Rovers and the South Dublin County Council, I think that's probably a, a roadmap that a lot of clubs should really be looking to emulate. And so it's great to hear you talk about the partnerships with Dub or Donegal County Council and, and other agencies within the, the region because I think it's vital that everybody's on board and, and really pulling in the same direction. And I think it's important also to hear you talk about how it's up to the club first and then look for support from the FAI rather than expecting the FAI to drag every club into this because sometimes I think fans are, are it's quite easy just to throw stones in the direction of Abbottstown and sometimes it's warranted uh, but most of the time maybe those people should be looking internally first and it's great to see that that's the the, the route that you've gone up in Ballybuffet and up in Donegal as, as a whole county um, in terms of this. In, in terms of the actual numbers though Paul you mentioned a couple of figures there about four million uh, from the government What's the shortfall? Are you still looking at maybe two or three million to finish the project on top of that? Oh, it'll, it'll, it'll take, uh, like I was dealing with the quantity, quantity surveyor this afternoon. So, you know, it'll be circa, circa eight or nine million when the complete stadium is done. But you, you made a very good point there about, if you look at the Brandywell, the Brandywell in Derry is the leader of that is Derry City Council. Tallis Stadium is uh, South Dublin Council and the proposed Bohemians... Shelburne Daily Mount is Dublin City Council. And if you look throughout Europe, there's a lot of models what they call municipal community stadiums. And they're led by local authorities. And that model would work well across Ireland and the partnership. And when I say three or four million, when I say that to the finance officer in Finn Park, I, the woman can nearly have a heart attack. So I have to be careful. But there is a strategy with partners working together and the good thing about the letter of allocation, the Harps last week, Breffney, was the minister and the junior minister. What they said in the letter was more important, actually, than the allocation. In that it said that they wanted to back soccer in County Donegal. And Jack Chambers, who's the junior minister, said that the government recognises that the League of Ireland needs to be supported to get to where it should be. So if you have the government so committed... What we need to now is, and this is where the FAI would come into it, you put a plan in action. So you ask each club to develop its plan. I know our neighbours, for instance, in Sligo Rovers are working on a plan as well. And we have the Derry City, uh, Brandywell, led by the council. So you could have, you know, we could get the structures right in the northwest. And I'm sure that can be done in the, 
you know, the northeast, the southwest, southeast. So if we all look at it regionally, you know, I can see a vision where there is good stadia and there's no need to be building something with 10 or 15,000 capacity. I think five or 6,000 is enough. We have Tala and a few of the city clubs will need bigger capacity. But for the League of Ireland, I'm looking across Europe. Like I worked a lot, if, if you were familiar with the guy who tried the 32 county idea uh, with regard to, uh, I forget his name now, but uh, he had people over from Holland presenting to us uh, and some of the concepts. So I learned a lot from that. Uh, and some of the models across Europe, there's a lot that Ireland can learn and we can mirror and copy a lot of it. And I think it'll work well. Yeah, no, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I think it's important. In terms of the expected size, you mentioned that kind of five to 6,000. Is that kind of the plan at the moment? for Yeah, the plan yeah. is the main stand, which is the phase one, which is the funding is for, is 2,000 uh, seater. If you think of, uh, you know, I've gone around all the grounds. If you think of Waterford United's ground, the stand opposite their main stand our second stand would be similar to that. It has an 1,800 capacity. And we're going to ask the fans this one now. We certainly want tourism behind both goals. And the fans will tell us if they want it to be standing or seated. But we want a very condensed stadium, which has good atmosphere. Fans very close. And if the fans want standing areas, that will be facilitated. And we might come up with an idea. You know, you've seen some of them where they use railway seats where you can put in seating, but they can be standing as well. But I think, you know, if it, with standing, it's 5,900. With seating, it'll be 5,200. Okay, but I think if you could fill either of those, I think everybody would be very happy and Ollie's budget might get a little bit of a lift down the line as well. Paul, um, it's it's fantastic to see someone with your history and your expertise coming into the league and really give and help out uh, with those that grant process because I think sometimes uh, people look at the uh, the grant announcements out from government on a regular basis every three or four or six months, whenever they are, and they, they moan about not getting grants, but then I just don't think people are applying for them from within the League of Ireland and be, are in a position to be shovel ready to avail of those grants when those calls are made. And I think you mentioned Sligo's uh, master plan. I think that's a huge step forward for them over the last 18 months. They've been working on that, I know, and they've got some really good people involved uh, and the other examples you called. So it's great to see someone of your calibre coming in and really lifting the the level of expectation and, and the, I suppose the... Um, just knowing the buttons to press and the doors to knock on to help, which is probably half of the battle within the league at times. So uh, well done for all your work up in uh, Ballybuffet and across the county of Donegal uh, over the last few years for Finn Harps. I know it's appreciated by the the fans and the the, the supporters of Finn Harps, but I think eventually will be support will will be appreciated by everyone who makes the journey up to Ballybuffet to to watch their team take on Finn Harps and hopefully from your point of view not come back with the victory, Paul. Uh, I better finish it off and, and leave it there but thank you very much for joining us it's nice to have uh, someone from the league leaders you mentioned challenging for Europe you're top of the league don't be underselling yourselves no no I don't. <laughs> but we, we don't want to lose the run of ourselves completely now but uh, it's good it's a good start to the season we're delighted and uh, well deserved Ollie's put a good panel together this year so hopefully as he said at the start of the season he wants the club to move up a notch this season he certainly started the right way. So uh, we look forward to being a very established team and to give you all a good rattle in years to come. Thank you again, Brefney. Paul McLoon, thank you very much. Looking forward to the fixtures at the weekend. Of course, full round of games with a bonus game, uh, the Derry uh, Shamrock Rovers game that, as we mentioned, postponed from a couple of weeks ago. Let's start with Friday night's action, the early kickoff, St. Pat's versus Derry. Derry really need to get uh, a, a good result out of this because it hasn't gone well for them so far yeah it's been a little bit difficult for them uh, they haven't haven't started great but um that'll be a difficult trip down to pats because pats look good and you know Stephen o'donnell has them has them really playing well they look sharp they look fit they're getting around the pitch and uh, they've edged a couple of results as well like so they'll be they'll be confident so uh, it's a difficult trip for Derry, but i'm sure they're working all week and we'll be hoping to get something on the board there and that one yeah, of course, then the later kickoff, the 7.45 kickoff, Dundalk versus Bowes, two teams who have been at the right end of the table for a long, long time. Again, we said a lot this show, uh, slow start for both. Both managers will be looking, or 
whoever the manager happens to be in Dundalk at the moment. Both management teams will be eager to get their first win of the season. Um, are we looking maybe at a, another stalemate here where we could be seeing both teams go another week without a win? Would that put extra pressure on them? Um, it's it's entirely possible it could end up being a draw and that you know both teams would, would take that in isolation in the game between each uh, each other. But um, they'll both be pushing for a win because a win really, you know, they need a shot in the arm, both of them. So um, I'm, I'm expecting both teams to come out kind of all guns blazing, and really needing to get a, a win on, on board. But you never know in this league, like it's still early days. Like you said, don't, ride, don't want to write anybody off just yet. A lot of quality in both teams, you know, lots of games to go, four rounds of fixtures, you're only at the start. So no panic stations, but um, I think both teams will be, you know, you could actually get a cracker there because both teams are coming out looking looking for a win. Like, Yeah, of course, you're in action then yourselves on Saturday evening, 6 p.m. in Bishopsgate, Drogheda United visitors. Uh, both teams promoted. I know Lee spoke to us about the game. What's your own thoughts? Yeah, I'm expecting a difficult game as always against Strada and especially um, those teams coached and managed by Tim Clancy are always really, really competitive, um, you know, highly competitive games, always back and forth, you know, never, never comfortable, never easy games. Um, I think we've slightly got the better of it over the last couple of years, but only only ever so slightly, you know, and um, they obviously went up as champions, we went up as, as playoffs, so... We'll both be looking to, you know, take points off each other as the season goes along and during the games. And this one being our home place, I think it's up to us to make the run in the game. So we'll be hoping to to get the result. But I'm sure they're coming in confident and they'll probably feel they can get something out of the game too. So again, expecting another decent game there. Obviously, of course, Callum Moorfield and Dean Byrne. We don't know yet whether they're going to play a part in that game. It could be a huge difference uh, if they're available for selection on uh, on Saturday evening. Uh, this other two games taking place at the same time as yourself, of course, Finn Harps and Waterford. Uh, top of the table, Finn Harps, Waterford, who got their first win under Kevin Sheedy last weekend. Uh, can Finn Harps push on here again? Can we see them continue to be top of the table uh, come the end of the weekend? It's week four now. Uh, how far are we away from them pulling a Leicester and actually going on and, and really competing at the top of the table? Yeah, they're probably favourites to win it now, aren't they? Because they've been up there. No, look. I think Ollie reckons he's still not safe from relegation, so it's yeah. Fine. I don't think I don't think we'll get anything from Ollie in that regard. Like, but um, they're doing great. Why why will they not fancy their chances of winning? You know, um, we we spoke to Stephen Fowler earlier in the year, and he was quite confident about how good the quality in the group was, and not just the kind of big strong outfit that are difficult to play against. Like they reckon they've a bit of ability and quality there about them as well, and so far so good. Like they've they've created chances to go on goals. They've They've got points on the board, so they'll be delighted. But um, Waterford as well got their first win, so you know they'll they'll probably be quietly confident. To, although it's such a difficult journey, having having just done it, going up to Derry and now kind of repeating the same thing. But again, why will they say we can do anything different? We don't. We've done it last week. We can do it again. Is I'm sure what the message will be in that changing room. Like, and then the final game of the weekend in the Premier Division, at least, uh, the clash of the Rovers in the showgrounds, Sligo Rovers versus their namesakes, Shamrock Rovers. Um, Shamrock Rovers have the chance to kind of leapfrog across Sligo and really put themselves into the top frame properly. I know they're kind of there uh, over the last couple of seasons, every week, every week, week in, week out, but um, they'll be back in the top two or three if they beat Sligo Rovers at the weekend. But Sligo themselves, uh, they've been running pretty hot the last few weeks Three good results so far. Uh, they'll be looking to uh, to push on and maybe keep that title challenge going. Yeah, absolutely, and and I'm sure they'll fancy their chances at home. Um, getting a result there, so we haven't seen Rovers kind of hitting a bit of momentum yet, just because they had that the second game, you know, called off there. Or, you know, they haven't played as many games just yet, so maybe just struggling for a little bit of rhythm more so than anything. not not necessarily struggling in terms of results. They've got a couple of decent results on on the you know, on the board already, but um, probably just looking for a bit more rhythm. So, you you know, it might be a game that Sligo fancy the chances of getting something and, as you mentioned, doing really, really well. So, again, at this stage of the season, when you've started well, there's confidence, there's a bit of momentum, there's a bit of continuity there with the team selection. So, why why would they not think they can get a result? Like, I'm sure they're, they're pretty confident and looking forward to the game. Yeah, and of course, they play uh, Sligo or Derry City. They travel to Derry City to play them in a refixed game next week. It's probably be, be after next week's show. We'll probably have a chat with it on the show next week. In terms of the first division, obviously, a full round of fixtures there as well. Cabotelli doing the early running. Uh, they're in action all games nine four or seven forty five on Friday evening. Uh, Cabotelli and Galway United. Uh, that's the, the the game of the round probably this weekend. 
Yeah, and like we said, um, Pat Devon's side, you can't write off. They've started brightly again. Six points on the board. Um, a small bit of a shock, maybe, that John Caulfield's side were beaten. More so probably the manner that they were 3-0 down early. But um, I'm sure John's working them hard all week, so they'll be coming up all guns blazing to get a result there. But it's never easy in Strabrook, and I'm expecting you know Pat to roll out the same kind of team and make it really difficult again. And if we're sitting here next week and Kevin Teeley have won, it won't surprise me at all. Yeah, another local derby, UCD versus Bray Wanderers. Uh, this is going to be the battle of a very young attacking side and then the influence of Brandon Kavanagh in that Bray side over the last couple of weeks can't be forgotten about either. Uh, that This is probably the best game to watch of the weekend, I'd imagine. Yeah, I imagine both teams will try and play some good stuff here. And, uh, you know, UCD, always good, positive players. Uh, a lot of young lads, as, as you mentioned. But Bray got a um, number of good young players themselves. So, you know, there'll be a head-for-head -head battle there. And maybe the likes of Gary Shaw or, or someone could be a little bit of experience there that can, can get Bray over the line. I'm sure Gary's desperate. Gary Crown will be desperate to get a, a win on the board. So um, that should be a cracker of a game. And like you said, uh, a lot of good football to be played there. So that would be one that is well worth tuning in for. Yeah, the three other games, Cork City versus Athlone, Shells versus Wexford and Treaty United versus Cove Ramblers in a Munster derby. Any of those three spring out at you? Well, I'd like to see what Shells do. You know, just um, hasn't been a brilliant start, but I think the year they won it, it was the same, a little bit of a slower start. Big squad, you know, big budget, a lot of players to call on. So I'm expecting them to kind of hit the ground running soon. And, you know, having my eye on that one a little bit is just to see can they can they really kick on now and, and kind of start getting the results that will separate them from the group. I'm sure that's what they're hoping to do. Yeah, and then Cork and Athlone, and obviously uh, the Treaty United versus Cove Ramblers, I think there's going to be some interesting battles there as well. Of course, all these games live on LOI TV in the First Division. Watch LOI and RT TV for the Premier Division games. And obviously, if you want any more information on the Women's National League, you can, of course, uh, check out our sister show uh, on the platform here, finalwhistle.ie. If you look up Final Whistle uh, Women's National League, you'll find us on all good podcasting platforms it's also on our youtube channel uh, dean that's pretty much it for this week um this was all i can do is wish you the very very best luck at the weekend thanks very much hopefully we can uh, get three points on the board and be in a, a better position to chat to you the next time Bill. well listen it's all about just keeping that scoreboard ticking over and keeping those league points accumulating to where you get to where you want to get to at the end of the season uh, thanks very much for watching and for listening and we will be back with you again next week talk to you then